This is Jeff Dice, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. I'd like to welcome you back after a bit of a hiatus. As we announced earlier, we are about to embark into a series of weekly podcasts on the book Human Action. It's something we've been planning to do for quite a while, and it's something which really represents in a sense, the culmination of where we've been trying to go with this show. So if you think back to earlier episodes, and hopefully you've been listening to those, uh, we have had a bit of an economics education already. We started way back with Carl Menger, and we walked through his principles of economics and his ideas about, for example, uh, the marginal revolution, his ideas about the origins of money. Uh, We worked through uh, Bomberwerk's second volume, which is basically also about the labor theory of value, and how we arrive at value for interest, how time preference works and why we pay interest when we borrow money. Uh, And then, of course, we walked through several of Mises' books. We started out going through uh, liberalism, which lays out his case for uh, the liberal state, for laissez-faire economics. We went through socialism, which gives his case uh, against the ability of socialist economies to calculate properly and allocate resources efficiently. We went through national economy, which lays out, I would argue anyway, a strongly decentralist and secessionist case. Uh, We went through some of his other books. We went through omnipotent government. We went through bureaucracy. We went through the anti-capitalist mentality. Uh, We went through one of his actually last full-length books, uh, The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science, which really lays out his method. But we've been thinking about and talking about and always looming in the background considering human action, his magnum opus, uh, really written in America, released in the late 1940s. And it's the kind of book that a lot of you probably know about. You probably think I ought to read that. You may own it. You may think I should read that. And it, it may look daunting. It may feel like going to the gym or eating your broccoli or something like that. You know it's good for you. You know you ought to do it but it's not so much fun. But I'm here to tell you that it actually is fun once you crack it and put your mind to it. Now, there is a little bit of work. I won't lie to you. Not everybody is equipped to read 900-page books in the society. And as I uh, mentioned the other day when I was at Grove City College giving a talk, does that make people who are actually willing to read 900-page books more important or less important in society? I would argue it makes them more important because there's fewer of them. So this is a book that you really, really, really want to sit down and and make yourself read. And when I say make yourself, I mean start it. And I think then it'll flow pretty naturally for you. Now, of course, it's a tough book. I'm not going to lie about that. And if you haven't, let's say, got much of a background in economics, if you have not yet already, let's say, read Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, well, then you should turn off this podcast and you should go get that book and you should hit me up for a free copy. I'll send you one. But if you've been developing as an Austrian or as a thinker, as a libertarian, this is a book that at some point you're going to have to grapple with. Now, like a lot of people, you've, you may have read it in fits and starts. That's certainly how I read it. Uh, I was introduced to this book in the 1990s, so I was not as young as some of you. I was already in my 20s. Um, and I've been through it in fits and starts, and I've really only gone through it straight through once. And, and it's pretty daunting. Uh, but If you give yourself the opportunity, if you convince yourself that it's worthwhile, uh, you've got about 881 pages. Divide that over 365 days in a year. You only have to read uh, two and a half pages a day. And at the end of this, you're going to be a better person. You know, we live in a world full of basically fast food for our minds. If you eat Doritos all day or eat Twinkies all day, there's there's a certain amount of enjoyment, pleasure in that, but you're probably going to feel pretty crappy at the end of it. And if you consume nothing more than uh, lightweight YouTubes or Twitter or uh, Facebook posts from your friends about Bernie Sanders or something like that, at the end of the day, you're probably going to feel like you've eaten saccharin and, and not much substance. So this is substance. So there's a lot going on in 2020. It's an election year. There is an awful lot of white noise out there. And this is the kind of book that can give you a refuge. It can calm the mind. It can It can take you away from the white noise, and it can give you a sense that you're accomplishing something. And how many books can do that? So all that said, 
uh, to help us open this series and to really make the case today for reading it, first and foremost, why this book's important, why lay people should read it, is our great friend, Dr. Sean Rittenauer, who teaches at Grove City College. I recently had the opportunity to see him. I was up there for a student conference they hold every March, excuse me, every February. He's also the editor of the Mises Reader, which is a fantastic collection of curated Mises, if you're interested in that book. Um, We will link uh, to Human Action in hardcover. We're going to be going through the 1998 Scholar's Edition. Even in hardcover, folks, it's only 20 bucks. The soft cover is only $10. We're going to have a coupon code, H-A-P-O-D. That stands for Human Action Podcast, H-A-P-O-D, which is going to give you $5 off either one of them. So if you really want the tiny little print soft cover, you can get it for 5 bucks, folks. Uh, We have an HTML version, which you can read entirely free online. We have a PDF version. But I'm here to tell you, this is one of those rare books that you're going to want to own. You're going to want to have this physically in your possession for the rest of your life. It, it, there, you can open it up at any page and benefit from it. Uh, it. It's not a perfect book by any s- stretch. We'll probably get into perhaps uh, some of the organizational flaws in this book, which Lou Rockwell has alluded to. Uh, but nonetheless, it's an important book. And if you read it, you are going to be so far ahead of 99% of the population when it comes to economics. So Sean Rittenauer, Dr. Rittenauer, Professor Rittenauer, Thanks so much. And what do you think of that lengthy, <laughs> long-winded uh, uh, introduction I just gave? Oh, it was fantastic. And you could have probably even said more and not uh, not plumb the depths of introducing this book. Well, it's it really is something. I want to start with the introduction and preface written in 1998 uh, by Drs. Herbner, your colleague, by Joe Salerno, Hans Hermann Hoppe, which introduced the book and gave it some context a lot of people might know that in the 30s, Mises had to flee Vienna and go to uh, uh, Switzerland, in, to Geneva, where he spent several years writing what came to be national economy. But as we find out from both their introduction and his, this is not national economy warmed over. This is a fully rewritten book. Mm-hmm. That's right. He uh, got to the United States and was persuaded – uh, in some sense, they give it another try because the national economy hit the public uh, and and rapidly sunk because the publisher uh, went out of business and um, World War II caused everything to be put on hold. And so he gets to the U.S. and I mean it's really a pretty amazing in a in a in a in a in a place where he has to start all over and doesn't have access to his past papers and library. He uh, uh, constructs this uh, second version, if you will, or rewritten version uh, in English. He writes it in English, and it's not a translation. It's, it's, it's tremendous. Well, imagine being someone, a man of his age in your 50s and go, having to flee your home twice. Yes. Coming to a new country and writing a book this dense and this sub- substantively complex, you know, with real tough theoretical conceptual ideas in a new language. Uh, it's incredible. It's clear that he had been uh, meditating on these ideas for a long time, and, and you know, some some people they that they can do it, and then they just continue to do it and do it and do it, and never really get to the end product. You sort of get the sense that maybe that may have been what happened to Carl Menger the last you know twenty, thirty years of his life. Uh, with Mises, he's 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 no doubt thinking about this. Um, and sort of meditating on these ideas and and outcomes, human action, and it's it's a really really monumental achievement. I mean, it's hard it's hard to overstate how important this book is for for economics and for social science in general. Yes, and he's not writing this book from some comfy perch at Harvard with a bunch of assistants and secretaries. He's writing this presumably uh, from a, his apartment in New York City. And I would like to add that he, Margaret, his wife, typed it. Yes, that's right. For him. That's right. And we have that we have that typewriter here in our building. Yes, at the Mises Institute in Auburn. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's an excellent. Um, it, it's really a lovely story about um, a, a, a husband and wife uh, working together each uh, in some sense according to their comparative advantage 
uh, each supporting the other, and um, and and you could see the the fruit of their labors. Right, and of course, it had to be a bit daunting in the sense that this is a serious labor, and he may not have known that it would ever be widely read. I mean, his work hadn't been that well received. And th- th- he faced the very real possibility of this book languishing in obscurity. Uh, th- that's right. I mean, uh, in some sense, uh, the, the introduction uh, that you referenced to the Skulls edition mentions this. It it did sort of, in some ways, the, the cards were stacked against it. I mean, on, on the one hand, you know, the cards were stacked against national economy because of the war and everything. But then even by the time human action comes out, the cards were stacked against it in the sense that in a way, the profession, uh, you, one could view the profession at having passed Mises by. It, it was already, uh, it was, it was already uh, sort of coming to, and Mises mentions this in, 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 in the book itself, that the profession was succumbing to sort of post-World War II social engineering mindset. It had become progressively mathematical, uh, even by 1949. Um, and and the the uh, shall we say the hot young economists such as Paul Samuelson were really uh, less and less interested in uh, economics treatises that developed uh, a whole system of economics using verbal logic. So it it in some sense uh, it was a little bit it was it was a calling of the profession back. And a lot of the profession just didn't want to didn't want to listen, and so it, it it easily could have you could easily conceive of this book falling into oblivion, and and in some sense the last you ever heard of Mises. And I think Lou Rockwell and the Mises Institute deserve some credit for keeping Mises in the fore and for making this book available. And and honestly, it's far more widely read today than it ever was during his lifetime. So that that's what more could any intellectual want than that. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I think, you know, from uh, what was it, 1963, when the third revised edition came out, uh, published by Regnery, I don't think it's I don't think the book itself has ever been out of fully out of print since since then. And so we're I mean, we're that's what uh, over 50 years uh, where the book in one form has has always been for sale by somebody. Hmm. And I mean, I would be willing to wager if I was a wagering man uh, that Mises really didn't anticipate that type of longevity. The other thing you mentioned is nobody writes treatises anymore. The treatise is a is a sort of a, an archaic relic at this point. Why do you think that is? Oh, I think it's, it's true. I, I think that the the profession itself is more and more uh, you know it likens itself. As a an empirical science, um, you know, quantitative, uh, you know, developing mathematical theories for sure. But at the end of the day, also wanting to very narrowly, uh, uh, you know, answer some type of narrow theoretical question or or some narrow empirical study. And so there's much more emphasis placed on individual articles uh, now, mm-hmm. even. Back, this is in uh, you know in the, in the mid '90s when I was getting my PhD. It was it was common. I mean, very common for the dissertation to essentially be three distinct articles, you know, thrown together in a book, and, and we'll, we'll put an introduction and a and a conclusion chapter and call it a book. But it was really three separate individual studies, and that was that was a standard operating procedure, and and I think. You know, there just was not. If you assume, if you assume that basically all good price theory derives from Alfred Marshall, essentially, uh, you don't really need a second Marshall. You don't need a second set. You don't need a second um, uh, treatise. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, with with the with the exception of Austrians, you don't see a lot of uh, general economic treatises written. The other thing I think we should consider is that, you know, he's born in the 1880s. So he's coming of age training as a student and as a young economist in the early 20th century. And really, at that point, economics was hardly a standalone discipline as we think of it today as hyper-technical and hyper-specialized. 
It was a much broader tradition in the early 20th century that encompassed things like logic and history and philosophy and sociology. And, and it was not at all the same discipline that we think of today. Oh, a- absolutely not. There, there were, you know, I think the economists felt somewhat compelled to uh, establish the foundation upon which they are making their claims about various economic principles and, and actually deriving and develop uh, these principles from clear uh, starting points, axioms or premises or what have you. So there was this, there was this uh, philosophical uh, bent to it, if you want to call it that. And there was, there was a, a, an interest in that. Um, the, the, those that departed from that way uh, were, were, were more the outliers, uh, I would say, you know, at least, at least uh, to, to World War II. Right. And of course, this was true intersectionality uh, across discipline. Mises felt comfortable writing across all, all, you know, several disciplines in a way that I think economists would be very scared to do today because they would be told to stay in their lane. Oh, I mean, you, you read through human action, you see him bringing to bear uh, philosophy, history, um, aesthetics mm. from time to time even, um, and, 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 you know, make, <laughs> making inroads, uh, providing sort of a pre-postmodern critique of postmodernism in his chapter uh, when he's dealing with polylogism. Um, he's, he's dealing with all these things, always in service of economics, right? His, in, his goal was not to be a philosopher or to be a historian, but he, he shows, uh, as you said, the intersection of economics with these disciplines. And he, 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 he writes about and talks about these disciplines, other disciplines in the service of economics so that and on the one hand, he's establishing economics as a, a true social science. And then he's also showing how economic knowledge is necessary to, to do history well. Um, and so it's yeah, and, you know, he he makes the point uh, I think elsewhere that, you know, a, a good economist has to be familiar with these other disciplines or you're, it's easy to, to, to get lost in the weeds. Yeah, I think about that a lot, too. I think, Sean, about, let's say, some brilliant young quant who graduates from Wharton Business School or Harvard uh, PhD in econ and goes off, works at the Fed or some, someplace like that, works at the Treasury Department and knows nothing about World War II or poetry or literature or anything much beyond spreadsheets and, and it, you know, 600 level math. <laughs> is that an educated person? Not, I mean, not in the Misesian sense, it is it. Exactly. I mean, it, it's a very skillful technician, but, um, you know, the, life's, life's much more than that. And, you know, as, as exciting as, um, as, a, as a consumption function may be, or as a spreadsheet may be, um, I, I mean, from, from the beginning, I uh, I gravitated towards uh, human action and 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 the Misesian framework because of its uh, understanding of of the, the the cause of all economic phenomena is the whole the whole man the whole person mm-hmm. and that was very attractive for me. Well, yeah, and the way he made his case in page after page is with dense text and argument. What you won't find in this book is any graphs or charts or numbers or equations. And even back in 1949, a long time ago now, he was derided for this as a so-called literary economist. They were already uh, bringing out the long knives uh, in service of the new mathematical empirical economics. And so I guess in a sense, this was viewed as old-fashioned when it came out. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, um, you get you sort of set a uh, hobbler sort of implied as much when he reviewed the book before for, for the publisher before it was uh, released. Um, when when you know, hobbler was asked about whether or not that uh, it should be published, mm. hobbler sort of gave a sort of a backhanded compliment that this is, you know, in some sense, like vintage Mises but wondered if if the profession hadn't passed Mises by already. And as certain, I mean, again, that that you can look and see that the, you know, people like, uh, you know, Paul Samuelson and um, his crowd, uh, he, he published uh, his uh, introductory treatise in 48. 
And uh, right around the same time, um, I believe uh, Friedman's essay on positivism was around 50, 51, something like that. So at the same time that that seemed to be the vanguard, it's like Mises writes his treatise in some sense to, to, to call economics back or to stem the tide and, and, and try to put economics on, on a firmer, realistic footing. Uh, and I think, I think that's, that's one of the things he was, he was clearly passionate about. And it's, it's like you, you'd mentioned, it's one of the things that he continued to be concerned about clear up to his writing of the ultimate foundation, uh, his last main work. And of course, if we look at the profession and the science of economics since, let's say, Mises' death in the early 70s, it's a disaster. I mean, the, the profession's <laughs> going the wrong direction, and it's not doing well. It's not predicting anything. Its, it's models don't work. Uh, it doesn't serve humanity. It doesn't really make us healthier or wealthier or wiser. It doesn't help us understand the world. It's, it's mostly a sinecure, from what I can tell, for professional economists. But uh, what I'd like to make this, this interesting point, and this certainly... Uh, you know, for me as a layperson who hasn't studied economics uh, at the you know at the college level per se, um, when you read this book, what's so great about it is it's it's sort of his fullest and final expression of a lot of thoughts because it came later in his career. So some of the things he introduces in theory of money and credit about the origins of money and business cycles and interest, some of the things he introduces in socialism and liberalism about governance and about the impossibility of uh, statist regimes to calculate, some of the things he introduces uh, in books throughout his career are now are sort of culminated and given his his best and fullest expression because he's had more years to think about them and expand them more fully. So if you don't read anything earlier or prior by Mises, you sort of get his greatest hits. It, it, you know, it's sort of like uh, a rock band has several albums and they finally reach full maturity on one. There's like Led Zeppelin II or something. Um, th I think in a sense, that's what human action is. Yeah, it's it's his um, sort of the richest, fullest treatment of these things. Again, that like I said, he'd been, he'd been meditating on and probably thinking about um, for, uh, you know, for, for well, in, in, in the case of, say, business cycle theory, probably for decades, and you, you see his fullest treatment of the business cycle um, in, in sort of the, the finished, the, 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 his, like you said, his last word, uh, in, in essence, his, um, his, his the, the argument and the importance, the importance of economic calculation is really driven home in human action uh, to, in, in, a, in a fuller, riper extent. Um, and so you see, yeah, you get to see, you get to see the, a product of a lifetime of thinking uh, in this in this work. Well, speaking of the introduction by Salerno Herbner Hoppe, one of the things that's so interesting to me in it is they say because he was in America at the time, because he wrote it in English, because of uh, you know Europe was coming out of World War II and America was sort of the forward-looking uh, young kid on the block. Um, th as a result, this book has been predominantly an American phenomena. It's, it's best known here. It's most widely read here. It had less of an impact in Europe, despite him being a, a, a man of old Europe. Yeah, that's right. And I, it is interesting, I think, in, in large part because uh, his, it, it was in English, so his, his, his followers were in America, um, you know, his greatest champions who are familiar with the work of people like Henry Hazlitt, uh, his students, uh, you know, Marie Rothbard, Israel Kirzner, uh, Hans Senholtz. Uh, they were um, working, living in America. And I think so in some sense, it's just a natural that that was a natural uh, reason why it became so popular mm -hmm. in, in America. I, I, I'm not exactly sure uh, if it you know, if if, if the, the language barrier was what is was one reason why it wasn't as is not as popular in Europe. Of course, you have there's ideological reasons why. I mean, if 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 he was sort of uh, going against the grain of of the of American thought, he certainly was going against the grain more so. I would think in 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 the thoughts of of Europeans uh, in general, in terms of just like the intelligent layperson. Sure. In, in the 1950s, um, there was not a lot of libertarian or classical liberal thought in Europe. 
to the extent it existed, I think it was mostly in America. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 so when does Hayek arrive at Chicago? Maybe a tad later than fifty. Yeah, I uh, don't. I'm not sure actually. Yeah. So so at some point, uh, Friedrich von Hayek, his his student and mentee in many ways, leaves the London School of Economics, comes to the University of Chicago, and ends up spending much of the rest of his life, not all of it, he, he returns to Germany ultimately, but spends much of the rest of his life in the US and ultimately receives a Nobel in economics. And in a certain sense, some people consider that uh, Mises is Nobel because it, uh, Hayek gets it about a year after Mises dies. And in the, in the minds of a lot of people, uh, we wouldn't without Mises, we wouldn't have Hayek, or at least not the Hayek we know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that that is understood. Um, I think it needs to be understood that Hayek had a lot of um, influences. Uh, clearly, he was influenced by Mises in in terms of his business cycle, but then in terms of his pure theory, in in some ways, well, in, in clear ways. I mean, Hayek acknowledges this. He's more influenced by by Wieser and and Schumpeter in a way too, and so even Hayek, Hayek is identified as Mises' student, but even Hayek is not, you know, pure pure Misesian in in that regard. Right. Um, now you know it's interesting in terms of the Nobel, and, and uh, there's a there's a piece written by Paul Samuelson of all people, where he in in, in a footnote, and I can't remember now even the the, the reference, but it's it's a fascinating little piece. It's a tribute to it was a tribute to Oaken, and um, in any event, uh, he has a little footnote about who he thinks that they had survived would have won a Nobel Prize in economics, and he lists Mises as one of, of one of the economists that he thought would. Um, not necessarily that Samuelson uh, thought he should, but but he thought that I mean Mises was. Highly regarded enough that he would, if he would have survived um, into, uh, you know, su- survived for longer a longer period of time. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think, given that that Hayek's Nobel Prize was given for his business cycle theory, I mean that that mm-hmm. is that that has to be an affirmation of what Mises was doing. Yeah, and of course it's interesting. The Nobel is supposed to be a particularist prize of sorts for for work in an area. It's not supposed to be a lifetime achievement award. That's right, exactly. Uh, so it's it's interesting that Samuelson said that, and I didn't know that. Um, so that's that's very interesting to me. Absolutely, yeah. My uh, my colleague Caleb Fuller pointed that out to me. So, you know, as a as an aside, you mentioned Henry Hazlitt. Henry Hazlitt was a huge benefactor of Mises upon the latter's arrival here in, in New York. Uh, he was a financial benefactor to Mises. Uh, he promoted him wherever he could. He reviewed uh, human action quite favorably in the popular press. And I, uh, I'm going to have to go back and check whether at that point that was New York Times or Newsweek. I believe it was Newsweek. Uh, and, and so it was people like this, uh, certain businessmen, Leonard Reed was a big backer of Mises. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's you know, maybe because of his, I would say, shabby treatment at the hands of academia, what, what you know, the man who's coming over here from Europe is really a, a, an economics master. Yes. And, and he's, he's not getting the credit and the position he deserves in American academia. Any university should have been thrilled to have him. So instead, he turns to businessmen and makes not the greatest living uh, through their largesse. And I just wonder, uh, you know, academics don't like that. They don't like intellectuals who are paid by businessmen, and they tend to resent that and, and be dismissive of that. I wonder how much that shaped Mises' view, because in in effect, he wrote for a popular audience in many cases. He wrote for the layperson. I mean, Human Action is not necessarily a book for a, a PhD student in economics. It's written for anyone, well, I think, of modern intelligence and interest in the field. And so... You know, I, I think to understand Mises, we have to understand the person, and I think we have to understand his life experiences. And I just wonder how much that shaped him, you know, having to uh, find work, paid work where he could. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a good question. I think uh, clearly his experience in having to leave Europe, I mean, def, I mean and, well, even when he was there, even when he was in 
in Vienna and and the political upheaval and and the and the and the, you know the real concern that um, that the that, that, that Europe was was, was going to go communist or the 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 hyperinflation they lived through all of those experiences you can you can you can sense the those how those experiences influenced certain uh, certain turns of phrase the pa- cer- there's certain parts of this book where some of his passion sort of just comes out and and, it, and it's kind of interesting you're reading along and it's a, it's it, it it's always always a well reasoned argument and you can get sort of get yourself in the mindset okay I'm, I'm I'm reading I'm reading this 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 logical treatise and then. And then all of a sudden, a really good, beautiful turn of phrase with a little bit of with a little bit of bite to it when he's talking about uh, people that want to uh, pr- promote ideas that are bent on destroying civilization. Uh, you get a little bit of a a little of a, a little bit of a of a prick there, and a little bit of a tweak. And um, it's it's you, you get a sense that you know he's li- he's already lived through it a lot um i think it was it's interesting i think it, it was i believe an anti-capitalist mentality he talks about how in europe one of the things europe had that, that we didn't have so much in the united states is in europe the intellectual classes and the entrepreneurial class um uh, interacted with one another more and so there wasn't quite the same suspicion in, in the old uh, say in the old days uh but when you come to the united states there was a sort of um, distrust between the intellectual class and 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 the business class, and uh, so I mean I I can I mean it would it'd be easy to, to for for a number of academic economists sort of to to see business or Mises's income arrangements at the, at New York University and just assume well here we go it's a classic a classic, you know, uh, sycophant for the, for the bourgeois businessman. So we don't have to pay any attention to him because he's obviously on their payroll. And, um, it would be, uh, it's, it's, it, that is like the most, the, the, the nastiest way to ignore somebody for some, mm-hmm. you know, Trump up reason like that. And of course, that's the same accusation level that Koch supported academics today. No, oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, I mean, People, the, the Mises always said is true, right? It, the, the 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 truthfulness or the the, the truth or the falsity of a, a theory uh, is based upon whether or not the theory is true or false, not by who's paying the person who's writing it. <laughs> you know, at, at some point, the argument has to stand or fall on its own, and if the argument is true, it's true. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, the income arrangements. Yeah, and it's interesting. You know, maybe this is not what he would have wanted. Maybe he would have preferred a, a tenured faculty post at a prestigious U.S. university when he arrived here, and maybe he and Margaret would have in, enjoyed a, a more money as a result, and maybe their lives would have been more comfortable. But you wonder if things didn't turn out for the best in the sense that this forced him into writing uh, and, and having the time to write books that are. are are much more enduring. How, how much do we really know about, let's say, articles written by the head of the Princeton or Harvard uh, e- economics department in 1949 when Mises came out with this book? The answer is not much. Uh, you know, I mean, other than the, uh, you know, Keynes and Samuelson and Krugman and a few others, I mean, he's as as well or better known than scores of dead economists who enjoyed at least ostensibly on paper more prestige at the time oh th- that's that's right i mean you can you can go you know one of the blessings of the internet you can go online and and look at uh, archive versions of you know long-standing journals like the american economic review or journal of political economy journal of economics etc and and you can go back and uh, go back to say the 40s and 50s on the one hand you can you can find a uh, Journals that were publishing and did publish uh, articles by Mises, and but then you can also look. Okay, who else is doing what? And and there are a good number of uh, articles written by people that you have, you know, you still heard of like Jacob Viner and people like that. But they, but but the difference there too is there are articles that right now you think, oh, I'd kind of like to read that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're interesting. But then there, but then there are a whole host of of people. 
that of course were were publishing in their day, and um, uh, and then then you've never you never heard of a, a, again. I mean, on the other hand, I mean, I suppose some of that's going to be true anyway. I mean, at any given moment, there's only a small handful of truly great thinkers in a discipline, and so in some sense, we shouldn't be surprised that you know, uh, say, the vast majority of economists even who were published. Even back then, when the number of journals were much smaller, uh, we we don't hear of uh, as much. Um, uh, one thing I have been impressed with is um, is a website uh, that's uh, managed by Erwin Collier called Economics in the Rearview Mirror, and he posts up uh, a number of uh, exams, old exams, and uh, syllabuses, syllabi, and reading lists from. Uh, past economics courses going from the late 1800s through um, most of them, say, into the 1960s, maybe. Uh, and these and from top programs like Harvard, Columbia, MIT, Chicago, et cetera. And I, I've, I've always been, I've, and so I've, I look through there from time to time, and it's interesting how, um, how many times in these, in these the top programs where Austrians, including Mises, uh, Hayek, and especially uh, Bavarik's uh, writings, were on the main reading lists of of basic theory classes, uh, not history of thought classes, but your basic theory classes. In other words, your profession recognized these as 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 viable as viable options and alternatives that you have to deal with in economic theory, and that was the case, you know, back uh, say before 1950. It was common. Uh, now, not so much, as you said. That the the the, the, uh, the profession is is as you know is in is in disarray. And of course, his private seminars at NYU uh, in Manhattan produced a lot of great thinkers. There were a lot of young people at the time who sat in on those seminars, who went on to prominence later on. At least in our circles, people like uh, Hans Senholz, people like George Reisman people like Murray Rothbard, people like Ralph Rako, people like Paul Cantor. Uh, talk a little bit about Hans Senholz, who is a, a protege of Mises and also obviously an important figure at Grove City and in developing Grove City as a, a, a home where uh, Austrian economics can be uh, considered and taught. Yeah, I mean, if, if it wasn't for, for Hans Senholz, I, w- I wouldn't be here probably because we wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't have the Austrian economic tradition that we do have. I mean, he he was one of four. Senholz was one of four uh, um, uh, students that 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 um, that had their PhDs directed by Mises in the United States. And um, soon after uh, he completed that, he was uh, hired uh, by J. Howard Pugh, uh, I think, at Mises's suggestion. Uh, to uh, head the economics uh, program here at Grove City. And so he starts, uh, I believe, in uh, 55 or 56 as the chairman of the economics program and the department and remained here until he retired in 1992. Hmm. And so, I mean, that's, I mean, those, that's several decades where he was the main uh, the main voice of economics, and of course, his economics was uh, all, uh, you know, Misesian, uh teaching Austrian economics uh, throughout the curriculum. And uh, he, I remember once I, I uh, was able to interact with him a number of times uh, before he passed. And one time, he told me he knew it was re- time to retire when he had students of his uh, saying to him, uh, "Not that you taught my." my father, but you taught my grandfather <laughs> economics. And I mean, can you imagine teaching essentially two full generations of students uh, sound economics? And um, and then, of course, I mean, he wrote a lot for uh, the Freeman, uh, which played an important role in, in educating, the, again, the, the, the layman uh, in sound economics. And um, you know, he was very busy in lecturing and teaching classes. He didn't, you know, he, he, all of his articles are always solid, but he didn't write very many, shall we say, purely scholarly works. But whenever he did, they were always top notch. Well, he also cared about teaching, which is a lost, a lost art today amongst academics. Yeah, absolutely. Now, did he stay in Grove City till he died? 
He yes, uh, he maintained his residence in Grove City even after. I mean, after he retired from uh, teaching here, he then served for a few years as president of the Foundation of Economic Education. But he still maintained his residence here. Uh, he and his wife uh, stayed here, and then when Hans passed, uh, his wife Mary uh, remained in the same house until until she passed uh, away, sadly, just a, a few years ago. So, yeah, um, it, it's uh, they 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 maintain a residence here. They he had uh, some rental properties in different places in the state, but uh, they mm-hmm. remained here. Well, an interesting story about Hans Senholz relating to Mises, and this comes courtesy of Richard Ebeling. People who don't know who Dr. Ebeling is, he teaches at the Citadel in South Carolina. And at one point uh, earlier in his career, he was tasked by Hillsdale College to go to Moscow, of all places, and retrieve uh, some of Mises' personal papers and documents that had been taken from him by the Nazis when he was forced to flee his apartment in Vienna. And it's a long, circuitous story how they ended up in Moscow in a railroad car, but at any rate, they did. And Richard Ebeling went uh, to the former Soviet Union to to bring back some of this these papers, which now reside uh, at, at Hillsdale College. And uh, Dr. Ebeling recounts a story where apparently in, in Grove City, Pennsylvania, um, Margaret and, and Ludwig von Mises were in church uh, for the christening uh, uh, of one of Hans Senholz's children and sat in the back pew and, and sat through the ceremony. And at the end of it, he turned to, to Margaret and said, that's enough religion for today. And uh, of course, this goes to his uh, professed atheism, also his views on religiosity, which apparently shifted over time. If one reads from, let's say, socialism written in the 1920s to human action in the 19, late 1940s, he seems to have softened a bit about the compatibility of uh, Christianity or other monotheistic religions like Judaism uh, with uh, uh, laissez-faire capitalism. So talk about that. Uh, Mises', Mises is lack of religion and, and how that worldview of his played into human action. Yeah, uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. I think you know, we mentioned this in, in, in the podcast we did on socialism. His remarks about Christianity and socialism were, were, were pretty negative and to the point of, of asserting that um, you know, Christianity is incompatible with um, a, uh, a liberal free society and, and a free market, um, is incompatible with private property. And, and uh, by the time by the time he writes human action, he says very clearly, there's nothing in uh, Christian dogma that is necessarily in conflict with um, with 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 a free market, with private property. There's, in other words, and, and uh, he points out that the, the the any any anybody that has any type of Christian or um, I, I think he says Christian, I think he mentions Christians, but he may just be, you know, serious religious sentiment um, cannot be opposed to an economic system that provides for the reduction of poverty for the masses. And, you know, so um, he, he, uh, there's, a, there's been a significant change uh, between social, his book, Socialism, and, and Human Action in his willingness to allow for uh, compatibility between between the two, and um, I always, of course, I mean, as a Christian, I find that very um, very uh, satisfying. Um, it would be it be hard to, um, to you know to if if it, if it actually is indeed true, it'd be hard to uh, embrace uh, a body of work that that is explicitly. You know, contrary to what one think is, is the case, especially if you don't think it's so. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I, I often wonder, and I'm at, you know, I don't, I don't know this for, I don't know this for a fact. It's somewhat speculating, but I do know that in in Europe, the Christians he would have been acquainted with would be different, I think, than the Christians that he became acquainted with in, in the United States. For instance, in in Europe, the the, the leading religious voices were by and large uh, socialist or highly interventionist. And he did Mises have a have a way of of sort of deferring to experts in in other fields. I think the way he expected those people in other fields to defer to his expertise in economics. And mm-hmm. so if you have a you know a leading Christian who themselves are saying that that socialism is really the only or at least the best economic system or social system to 
for Christian to embrace, well, then he's going to think, well, if that's the case and these guys should know what they're talking about, well, then um, I guess Christianity is not compatible with the free market. But by the time he comes to the United States and he's he's interacting personally with, uh, you know, Christians who are successful industrialists, successful entrepreneurs who believe strongly in the free enterprise system and the free market, somebody like J. Howard Pugh, where – uh, you know, S- Senholtz once told me a story where uh, Mises and uh, J. Howard Pugh were sitting in the lobby of a hotel in New York, and they were sort of playing, uh, sort of playing stump the professor. In other words, that they were each trying to stump each other on some type of, uh, I don't know, trivia fact or historical fact or economic principle or something. And so they were playing this little game amongst themselves. Well, if they're that comfortable. You can just imagine that at some point in time, there must have been some discussions that um, you know, Mises recognized that, wow, there are sincere uh, Christians who are not at all opposed to a free market and don't see it as incompatible. And so I just sometimes wonder if, if his experience in, in the United States, even you know, given his trying circumstances, helped him to see things a little bit differently. Or, of course, the understanding that the Christian West had produced the freest economies in the world. Oh, sure. I mean, in some sense, the, that proof is definitely in the pudding. Yeah. So let me just read uh, to our, for our listeners a quick sentence from page 155 of the Scholar's Edition here, where he says, In our time, the most powerful theocratic parties are opposed to Christianity and to all other religions which evolved from Jewish monotheism. So I think he's talking about basically this, again, this is 1949, so the Nazi experience is still a fresh scar, a fresh wound for the world. Yes. And so, uh, you know, he he is sort of professing an understanding of the, of, uh, the uh, you know, the omnipotent state's hostility to a competitor for people's hearts and minds in the form of, let's say, Christianity. Yes, I think that's right. Yes, the uh, the uh, theocratic uh, system he's talking about, or is is the system that thinks that you know that the Fuhrer is divine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not. It's not, it's definitely a statolatry. It's not uh, Christianity or, or Judaism of, of any sort. Mm-hmm. Well, before we plug the book again and get everybody on board uh, to to get into this book for next week, let let me just ask you to to conclude here by talking about the organization of the book into seven parts. Uh, They're pretty long, especially part seven gets a little esoteric. Part one is very densely philosophical. And here's what I've noticed about it is that uh, non-economists like myself tend to like part one. I was an English major in undergraduate. That appeals to me. I like dealing with it conceptually. The economist types tend to not like part one so much. Um, I I mentioned earlier that Lou Rockwell had had, uh, said to Christy Holmes here on our staff one time she was digging through this book and saying, Lou, this book's so tough. He said, Christy, uh, it could have been organized differently. Uh, And of course, he's saying that from the perspective of someone way back at Arlington House Publishers. So give us your thoughts on how this book is laid out and did, did did uh, did that do a disservice to the reader? Well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I guess, I would not say in general it does a disservice to the reader. I do think, as you identified already, that different people will warm up to different parts naturally. Uh, for me, uh, the th- I, I, I picked it up as an economics major in college. So I already was an economics major, but the thing that still – well – I was on the verge of becoming an economics major. I really liked economics, but the thing that was nagging at the back of my mind – was uh, is economics real? Is it really closer to intellectual game playing, or is it about is it real in the sense that it, it's worthy of study and pouring your life into sinking your teeth into? And and the first that first part of of the book when Mises is uh, it, it begins with ta- discussing the nature. Of, of human action, what it is and what it's not, um, dealing with uh, why do we start with human action because all uh, economic phenomena is, is, is a consequence of human action. So that's where it all begins. And then you know, delineating, distinguishing economics be- between economics and history. Um, and then defending economics against uh, claims of uh, you know claims that economics isn't real science 
or uh, economics is too rationalistic, et cetera, et cetera. And then building from that, the first analysis of human action, what are the general principles of human action? And, and then, uh, you know, what action is, what are the principles of action? All the fact that all action takes place in time, the fact that we, th- from action, we manifest the law of margin utility. All of those things come out of uh, just the basics, or, or, or what should one say? All of those principles are uh, inferences of of human action. And to me, starting where he does is what made is ultimately what convinced me that you know economics is a real social science that's worthy of study. And so even me, one who, uh, I mean, I had, I, I, I had an appreciation for literature. I had an appreciation for philosophy. Um, I sort of, I, I, I like asking the, you know, but why questions, why is this important? Okay. But then why is that important? Why should we care? What, what's the basis? I like those kind of questions. And so I also like the, the, the first part of, of the book, but the whole, even that is setting really is setting the stage for the rest of the book, right? because in other words, if we can't if we can't root uh, the determination of prices in realistic human action, then we're just we're just we are in some sense sort of playing mental games. And so, uh, starting with human action is 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 really important, and it's it's to me it's 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 the right it's the right place to begin. Um, it does it does get somewhat philosophical. Um, and he is using categories that were uh, very much um, in, in uh, recognizable in his day. Some of them, uh, the terminology is different, so you kind of have to be a little bit aware of that. But nothing that makes it unintelligible. I mean, one of the benefits of the book is it's very intelligible. But then as he, he moves on, he sets the stage about human action, so then he can start talking about, okay, uh, how do humans interact in society, because economics is about human interaction primarily through exchange. So he begins and he starts talking about uh, what is, you know, what are some principles of human action that apply to action in society, and then he notes that, and, and he highlights the importance of economic calculation. That in this in this diverse, uh, complex social uh, economic order, this market division of labor. Uh, the only way that economic ca- activity can be coordinated uh, throughout the social order and throughout the intertemporal production structure, what is required is economic calculation. There has to be economic decision makers that have access to profit and loss calculations um, based on market prices, uh, because there has to be some way of trying of of of, of producers satisfying the subjective preferences of other people. And these producers cannot read the minds of other people. And so they have to have a way of doing this. Well, they do it through economic calculation. And so economic calculation is of, of great, great import in this book. And as he, then as he goes along, that's why, I mean, the, the chapter on prices is quite lengthy. The discussion of indirect exchange and monetary prices is quite lengthy because it's these monetary market prices that that entrepreneurs use to calculate profit and loss. And then also it's monetary prices that are used to calculate interest rates so that uh, producers can decide, you know, how 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 capitalist, how capital intensive uh, do, do we need our production to be? And then he then moves on. Uh, to talk about uh, and apply these same principles, discussing a very realistic uh, determination processes of factors of production, uh, the, the prices of, of labor, the wage rate, the price of land, uh, land rent, etc. Um, and then uh, he brings all of the analysis to bear on, shall we say, alternative economic uh, arrangements. Um, uh, what you know, what kind of social cooperation, if any, could we have in uh, in, a, in, a, in a an economy without a market, right? And that's where he, he brings he up he sort of uh, presents his full mature statement on the possibility of economic calculation in a socialist system, and then following that, it's a fairly 
lengthy section on what he calls the hampered market economy. What are the consequences of government intervention in various ways through taxation or price controls, et cetera? Uh, it's in that chapter. In that section, he has a, a chapter on the economics of war and how, how destructive war is. And then finally, in part seven, he, he gets, in some sense, uh, he, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting way to end the book. He talks about the place of economics in society. And it's, it's in that section where he really – he really emphasizes that, look, economics is not uh, a body of knowledge that is important uh, merely or even primarily for professional economists. Uh, economics is important for the citizen, uh, the person in a free society who has a role in shaping uh, the institutions uh, and, and, and the laws of a nation uh, if we do, if we, if we try to alter or change or uh, put down or affirm institutions without a knowledge of economics, it's 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 a disaster waiting to happen. And so he ends the book with his sort of final statement on why economics and the study of economics is important uh, for a society. Well, that's about as good an exposition as anyone could hope for. So, ladies and gentlemen. If you've read a little bit of this book, if you've thought about it, if you own it, if you're thinking about owning it, now is the time. Uh, we're going to provide some links to buy the book, to read the book for free in HTML format, which you can uh, skip from chapter to chapter easily. You can search it. Uh, we're going to provide a link to Sean Rittenauer's Mises Reader. We're going to provide a link to Bob Murphy's Study Guide for Human Action. There's never been a better time because over the next coming seven weeks, we are going to have a variety of great economists walk you through this and simplify it and put it into uh, terms that we can all understand. So I really uh, you know, recommend this project to you. I'm excited about it. It's a thrill for me personally to go back and spend time inside the mind of, of Ludwig von Mises. And I, I can't think of anything better I would rather be doing late at night watching some goofy YouTube about dogs or something. So uh, we'll be back in about a week. And we'll have a variety of great guests, as mentioned, people whose names you know, people who are, are thoroughgoing necessians. So uh, you won't have a better opportunity to walk through this book with some people who are going to help you make that a lot easier and more enjoyable. All that said, Dr. Sean Rittenauer, I want to thank you so much for your time, and we hope to speak with you soon. No, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.